College football playoff is on New Year's Eve. Uh, 4 o'clock Eastern game and 8 o'clock Eastern game. Both of them single-digit spreads. No rematch between Michigan and Ohio State, at least not yet. Could get it in the national championship game. Oh, wouldn't that be something? Ohio State would have to beat Georgia, though. C.J. Stroud and company getting a second chance after Michigan blew them out. TCU, uh, out of that Big 12 championship game loss to Kansas State, is taking on Michigan. The Georgia-Ohio State games in Atlanta, Michigan, TCU, and Glendale. All right, Brady Quinn, Danny Cannell, Chris Hassel, it's time for semifinal keys. And let's start with the Georgia Bulldogs, Danny, who are looking to become the first repeat champions of this playoff era. Alabama in 2011-2012, the last program to do it. As great as they looked offensively against LSU, I think the first key has to start with the defensive side of the ball and how do you slow down Ohio State's prolific attack. And I think that starts with shutting down the ground game. No matter who's been at running back for the Ohio State Buckeyes, if you're able to establish that, that just opens up so many things in the pass game. So that, to me, was the first key. was shut down the, the, the run game. Then it comes to if you can do that and make them one-dimensional, then you've got to try to tee off on C.J. Stroud. Pressure him like any quarterback. If you're able to pressure him, he gets uncomfortable. That's where he gets a little bit more erratic, and you can get some of those turnovers that Georgia's defense likes to thrive on so much. And then if you flip it around on the other side of the ball, I think on Georgia offensively, you try to push Ohio State around. That's worked for Michigan the last two years in a row. Georgia, with all that physicality, hear about the SEC offensive and defensive line, how much those, those trenches matter. I think that's where you try to push them around a little bit up front, establish the line of scrimmage. That's where Stetson Bennett is best off play action pass to his tight ends. I think that, those are the three big keys for Georgia to knock off Ohio State. Danny, we've got very similar keys because I think we see this Ohio State team very similar in how Georgia matches up against them. To me, the first thing is you got to pressure C.J. Stroud. He's a different quarterback. When you pressure him, get hits on him, push him outside the pocket, the accuracy goes down dramatically. We're talking about 20 percentage points in his completion percentage when he's under pressure or playing from a clean pocket. When he's in a clean pocket, he's surgical. He's one of the best out there. The next thing I'll go to is there at the bottom. You got to double Marvin Harrison. You cannot allow Marvin Harrison to impact this game whatsoever. He's the best wide receiver in college football. He will be able to make contested catches, even with versus your best cornerback, because of his size, catch radius, run, route running ability, speed, athleticism, all those things. So you have to eliminate him from the equation. Make Emeka Abuka, make Cade Stover at tight end, make Julian Fleming a wide receiver. Someone else beats you for Ohio State. Then you talked about uh, you know, stopping the run. I, I, don't, I don't know that Ohio State's been able to run the football that effective, and I definitely don't think they can with the way they match up versus the Georgia front. So they may try to run the football, but I'm not as concerned there. I think it more comes down to being able to stop Ohio State's big playmaking ability on the outside. Then on the flip side for Georgia, it's just running the football. You know, that's, that's not, I mean, you talk about bullying Ohio State's defense, that's how you do it. You bring the physicality, you bring the offensiveness to, uh, to them. Uh, to Ohio State by running the football and not putting the, you know too much on Stetson Bennett's shoulders and trying to make this a shootout. Even though Stetson Bennett's been capable this season, uh, I still think you've got to be able to run the football, have that balanced attack, and really just, you know, much like Michigan did versus Ohio State, stick the dagger in this team. The narrative right now about Ohio State is they're soft. If that's the case, if you're Georgia, test that every single time and run the football and bring the physicality to them. And on the other side of things for Ohio State, they are an underdog for the first time in two years since that national championship game two years ago. And they have not lost back-to-back -back games, Danny, in nine years. Urban Meyer's second year. That's pretty unbelievable. I didn't know that stat. Um, if they're going to want to knock off and you know pull off the upset, I think you got to look at what they do best, right? And that's throw the football. This high-powered offense it has been so prolific under Ryan Day's tenure. They have to take advantage of that. So to me, it comes down to hitting those big plays. And if you go back and watch the Tennessee game against Georgia, early in that game, there were opportunities for Hendon Hooker to get those big plays. Missed on them just by a couple of feet, a couple of overthrows, which might have changed that complexion of that game. Maybe not. Georgia probably still wins. But for Ohio State, they're going to have to hit those big pass plays. And a little bit of a rough blow for them that Jackson Smith and Jigba has announced just in the last few hours that he's going to go ahead and forego this to prepare for the NFL draft. But there's still plenty of talent galore, including Marvin Harrison Jr. has been spectacular this year. But they've got to hit on those big pass plays when they are there. Then on the defensive side of the ball, 
This team has been pushed around. We looked at the keys for Georgia. They want to bully uh, Ohio State's defense. Well, that's what you got to do on the Ohio State defensive side of the ball. You have to make them one-dimensional as well. They want to establish the ground game. And Stetson Bennett, as good as he was against LSU in the SEC championship game with those four touchdown passes in the first half, you say, all right, Stetson Bennett, you're going to have to do it again. And so you're going to have to beat us through the air. We are not going to let you beat us on the ground. See if you can turn this game into a shootout. That, I think, is the recipe for Ohio State to potentially pull off this game. High scoring game, high possession. Your offense is, you know, is playing in rhythm. You're getting those big plays, going up and down the field, and making Stetson Bennett versus C.J. Stroud. Because if that's the matchup in a nutshell, I give the, uh, the edge to uh, C.J. Stroud in that type of game. So if you're Ohio State, want to pull it off, I think it's got to be a high-scoring affair. Uh, and interesting, because I think we're talking about the same thing again here, just in different ways. You know, I think you got to put this game, if you're Ohio State, on, on uh, Stetson Bennett's shoulders. And that, so that encompasses stopping the run for Georgia, but then trying to make it into a shootout, as you're calling it. But I think more just putting them in more passing situations, winning those early downs, and putting them in third and long where they've got to throw the football, and it's on Stetson Bennett's shoulders. And in saying that, you got to eliminate Brock Bowers. You could probably say the rest of the tight ends too, but it's hard considering all their different attributes, the way those guys too can match up. But you have to find out where Bowers is, whether it's jet sweeps, which he's very much capable of running, whether the passing game downfield. You have to know where he's at. You have to eliminate him from third downs, red zone. And anytime they're really in need of a big play, that's who they go to in this passing game for Georgia. And then finally, I'd say for the Ohio State offense, up-tempo, ball out quick, wear down Georgia's defense, right? Side to side, laterally. Ohio State has a lot of speed, uh, as does Georgia's defense. And, and obviously, this is a good defense considering they won it all last year, lost a lot to the NFL, were able to replenish that. And look, Kirby Smart mixes in these guys, but try to wear down Jalen Carter. Try to wear down those big guys up front and not allow them to try to dominate the line of scrimmage. And you do that. And, and honestly, Ohio State plays their best when they're playing more of an up-tempo uh, style of offense and then spinning the ball around and spreading it around. So to me, that's kind of one of the keys that when this offense gets stale for Ohio State, it's in part because they don't put enough pressure on opposing defenses with their tempo. And that's where I think C.J. Stroud, like a you know, basketball point guard out there, is at his best, you know, playing up tempo, spreading the football around. So to me, those are the three keys. Uh, Danny mentioned Jackson Smith and Jigba, who is uh, declaring for the NFL draft. He probably wasn't going to be able to play in the college football playoff anyway with the hamstring injury. But what do you see from him at the next level? Is this a guy that is going to be a, a top 15 pick in your mind? Uh, without question. I mean, I think you're going to go back and look at what he put on film last year in the Rose Bowl performance, which really set him off and, you know, really burst him onto the scene. And you're going to get a, a, an athletic, versatile, great route running, explosive receiver that every NFL offense is looking for. And while Jackson sits in Jigba, I don't, I don't know if it's the injury to the hamstring or not. It feels like it might have been an opt out for the season and you had a nice excuse to use it. But even if that's the case, which I don't have a problem with, essentially we saw Jamar Chase do this. He actually opted out of the COVID season and it didn't impact his draft status or his ability to succeed at the next level. I think that's what you're going to see with Jackson Sith and Jigba. I don't think his injury has any impact or the fact that he only played in three games this year on his draft st uh, status. And I don't think it has any impact on his ability to excel at the next level because he's a pretty complete, versatile package here for whatever team decides to draft him. Yeah, it's a hamstring. Let's be real here. Uh, it feels like that maybe he's already got an idea of who he's going to sign with as an agent. And uh, he basically opted out of the season based on his performance a year ago. Uh, bottom line, guys have played through much worse. We just watched Caleb Williams in the Pac-12 championship game literally limp around the field almost for a half of football and was probably a torn hamstring. And he's probably not going to be able to play in their bowl game. Uh, so it's just a bit surprising that, you know, they're not just outwardly saying that what it was. I don't think anyone would have judged him based on the season that he had if he would have just decided to opt out. I I'm a little more hesitant to go ahead and throw him up uh, this high as part of this list. Uh, I'll be curious to see how fast he's able to run. Uh, I think when you watch him on tape, uh, I don't want to put him in the same category as Emeka Buka, who's on that roster at Ohio State, or even Marvin Harrison Jr. I think both those guys are faster. Uh, I'll be curious to see if he gets into the 4-4s four uh, as far as his, his overall 40 time. He's not the biggest guy either, six one, foot one, 200 pounds. Um, he doesn't bring that type of you know catch raise and size that you're looking for. He does have great hands. He's a solid route runner. You know he's very well coached. Uh, coming from Ohio State with Brian Hartline as their wide receivers coach and, and passing game coordinator. So he's got all those things to his credit. But I do also wonder how many teams are going to look at the way he handled this season and maybe question that too, maybe question some of his toughness uh, when they bring up that hamstring injury, if indeed that is truly the reason why he sat out. So uh, I don't necessarily know that I have him quite as high 
because I think if he came back on Ohio State's roster this year, we just heard Dave Biddle say this, uh, that Marvin Harrison would have still been the number one wide receiver, and he still would have been the guy that showed out uh, as the better receiver of the two. And even though he's not draft eligible and he will be a year from now, uh, it probably would have, might would have made Jackson Smith and Jigba look a little different. So I'll be curious to see if he's a top top 15 pick. I think you've got probably three quarterbacks to go in the top uh, 15. Jalen Carter's a player who's going to go in the, in the top 10, top five probably. Amongst some other players too will be a part of this draft class. Uh, so maybe some competition for finding his way in the top half of the first round. But I do think he's a first round talent. Only played in three games this season for Ohio State. If there's one team that could sustain a loss like that at the receiver position this season, it's Ohio State, and they've done just that. Let's move on to the other semifinal and get keys for Michigan and TCU. And for the Wolverines, Blake Corum, all the talk all season. Maybe this guy's going to end up in New York at the Heisman ceremony. He goes out for the season, and they don't skip a beat with Donovan Edwards, who's gone for 100 yards in back-to-back -back games. Uh, it should be the least surprising thing that there was no drop-off. I mean, that's the one thing with certainty you know with the Jim Harbaugh coach team here at Michigan. He wants to run the football, and to me, this is a credit to the offensive line and the mentality that the Wolverines have, where it is truly a next man up. And with Blake Corum going down, Donovan Edwards, not only two 100-yard-plus games, but you had one that was over 200 yards versus Ohio State and then 185 against Purdue in the Big Ten championship game, which is, to me, why the number one key for Michigan is dominate the run game. Much like you've done all season long, they had the 400-plus-yard performance against Penn State where they ran over them. That is the risk that TCU runs, run, getting run over that style of game. If they don't have that, if they do get slowed down somewhat, that to me is where it comes down to J.J. McCarthy. Where we've seen him excel is the highly efficient performances, where you're not asking him to go out there and throw it 30, 40 times a game. It's connect on the big hitting plays when they're there, like he did against Ohio State uh, in the rivalry game, like he did in the Big Ten championship game. When those big plays are there, take advantage of them. When the plays on the ground are there, take advantage of them. But be efficient like you've been at your best. And one of those reasons they made the switch from Cade McNamara to J.J. McCarthy was to get those big plays. So a highly efficient pass game. And then lastly, for me, on the defensive side of the ball, it smother the TCU offense, much like they've done to a lot of inferior opponents throughout the season. They have more depth, too. I think the starting 11s on both sides of the ball, TCU, I give them an outstanding chance to hang with Michigan. It's when you get deeper in the game. And like we saw TCU in their Big 12 title game, exhausted. You saw Max Duggan, the quarterback, but every player on that team, exhausted. That's where I think Michigan, like a bunch of body blows throughout the game, can wear you down. So if they can do that, smother TCU um, on the defensive side of the ball, I think that's their best chance for success. Such an interesting matchup in the semifinal game. These are two of the best second-half teams in the country. Michigan's number one in point differential in the second half. Uh, TCU is number five. So pretty incredible when you look at their season and how really everything's worked out for them. It's been the second half where they've pulled away in games. So I almost kind of wonder going into this game, whether it's Michigan or TCU, how much of a lead do you need to build up in the first half in order to kind of protect that in the second half? But as far as my keys go, it's eat up time of possession and run the football. And, and we talked about Donovan Edwards and they're not being a drop off from Blake Corm not being in the backfield. And that's because of their offensive line. They won the Joe Moore Award a year ago. They'll win it again this year. Olu Oluwatimi, their center, has been phenomenal this year. He's a transfer from Virginia. He's really been the anchor of that offensive line. Very smart player. And at the point of attack, he's kind of been leading the way for this, this offense, running the football, and then pass protection, getting them all set up to protect J.J. McCarthy. So uh, it's the physicality of the offensive line, running the football, eating up clock, and really frustrating TCU, not allowing them to get into rhythm in their pass game. So you're kind of playing your best defense with your offense running the football. The next two things are really more for the Michigan defense. And the first is keep uh, Max Duggan in the pocket. You know, you talk to a lot of teams that went up against TCU this year. They really feel like Max Duggan wants to get outside the pocket. He wants to run the football. He wants to try to create and find bigger plays down the field. We saw that in the Big 12 championship game, literally putting TCU on his back running the football down the field. I'm still trying to figure out why they didn't use them on third and goal and fourth and goal in overtime and give him the football, let him try to run it in. But I digress. Um, it's keeping in the pocket, trying to make him play from the pocket, and then finally shutting down Kendra Miller. You know, when you take away the balance away from this offense and force it to be all on Max Duggan's shoulders, playing from the pocket, that's where this team struggles. I think Michigan's very capable of doing so. TCU, the biggest long shot by far, plus 1,600 to win the national championship. What are the keys for the Horn Frogs as they try to get the Big 12 their first playoff victory? I know it's a big number. I know they're a long shot even in this game as a 9.5-point underdog. But I think this team has been thriving in that underdog uh, role all year. And as the underdog, 
I think the one thing that's important, because this Michigan team is bigger and stronger than TCU, and that's not an offense. TCU's found a way to beat bigger and stronger teams like Texas throughout the season, but my first key is don't get run over. This Michigan team is more than capable of doing that. They did it to Penn State, as I mentioned before. They've done it to Ohio State. They've done it throughout uh, other teams uh, throughout the past couple years under Jim Harbaugh's tenure. Don't get run over. Even if it takes getting up eight, nine guys in the box and risking your corners on the outside versus the pass game, you do not want to let Michigan establish that run game. So I think that's the most important uh, you know, um, key to this game for the TCU Horned Frogs. The next thing is let Max Duggan do his thing, which I think Sonny Dykes will do a great job putting him in positions to succeed. But a lot of times it is out of the pocket, whether running the football with his legs, improvising on the outside. I wish they would have let it take a QB sneak because I think that would have been letting Max Duggan do his thing in the Big 12 championship game too. But let him do his thing. And then the other critical component of this game, I know this is a team that has come from behind time and time again throughout the season. The fourth quarter and second half com uh, comebacks are well documented. In this game, I think it's imperative that they play from ahead, if at all possible. You know, scripted plays, tempo early, find a way to get the lead, because if they're playing from behind and Michigan feels comfortable sustaining run drives, you know, running the ball, not having to pass the ball very much, I think that is a recipe for TCU to lose. But if they can get out ahead, even 7, 10 points, and you can sustain that lead, keep that lead, make Michigan feel like they might have to get out of their game plan, throw at them more than they would like to, that to me is where TC wants to be. I know they're the come from behind kids, but in this game, I think it's imperative they try to get an early lead and sustain it throughout. Yeah, I said the same thing here. Get off to a fast start. I mean, that's putting it simply. Maybe less words than how many you're using, Danny. But that they've got to get off to a fast start in this game because of how good Michigan's been in the second half of games. Uh, I talked about them being the best point differential. So that's part of it. The next thing is you've got to shut down the running game uh, and, and Donovan Edwards. Make J.J. McCarthy throw the football 30-plus times. He's only done that twice in his career, twice this season, once versus Indiana, and, and rightfully so. Indiana was the worst pass defense uh, that we've seen uh, in the Big Ten this year. And then uh, the other time was Illinois. When they lost Blake Corum, they had to come back in that one. They needed J.J. McCarthy to throw it that much. That's not what Jim Harbaugh wants to do. And so I think if you want to make that game a shootout, it plays more to the style that TCU has really won this season. Uh, and it plays outside of what Michigan has done. Not saying that J.J. McCarthy can't. He's answered every question that we've asked of him this year when he's been questioned. But it's not really their style, what they'd like to do. And then finally, win the turnover battle. You know, I think it's imperative that TCU doesn't give Michigan additional possessions where they can run the football. Donovan Edwards' big playability uh, as, as part of that, but also J.J. McCarthy in the passing game. We've seen with Cornelius Johnson downfield, uh, Ronnie Bell downfield, uh, and obviously Roman Wilson, who's got a ton of speed too, really has, has been quiet of late, but still very much capable of doing so. So this is one where I think Michigan overall is the better roster, deeper rosters. You kind of touched on, Danny, but they've got to win the turnover battle on this one. All right, Brady Quinn, Danny Cannell with their keys to victory for all four playoff semifinal teams. We'll do this every day for the next three and a half weeks, so uh, <laughs> keep those no thoughts doubt. in mind. Uh, Cover 3 podcast, we'll be talking college football playoff and all the bowl games. Uh, on the latest episode, though, I think it's going to be a lot of transfer portal. The Cover 3 guys have been all over the transfer portal palooza over on the 24-7 Sports uh, YouTube page. If you want to download and follow the Cover 3, just use that QR code on your screen right there. Scan that. It'll take you directly there. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.